Mr. Sunit Kumar to please present the virtual presentation to our guest of honor, Mr. Amar Pal Shokin sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Amar Pal sir. Good morning, sir. I think he is not here. Sir, he is here, but his mic is muted. Okay, if sir are listening, then kindly accepted the guest of honor certificate from Balgotia's university. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. May I again request Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Program Chair, Department of Forensic Science, Balgotia's university, to deliver the vote of thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kosi. It gives me immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks at this inaugural session of the Forensis Agora Faculty Development Program on Interdisciplinary Research in Forensic Science organized by Department of Forensic Science in collaboration with Forensic India Private Limited. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtue, but the parent of all the others. Following these great words by Sistro, I express my sincere Gratitude to our Honorable Chancellor, Sir, Mr. Sunil Galgotia, for providing us a platform to put our effort into our action. I would like to extend my gratitude toward our Honorable CEO, Sir, Mr. Dhruv Galgotia, for his constant guidance and support. My heartfelt thanks goes to our Chief Guest, Mr. Mathli Saran Gupta, National President, Crime Free Bharat Mission, and former DGP, Madhya Pradesh, your words of wisdom and encouragement will surely boost up the confidence and morale of our young participants. And we assure that we at Department of Forensic Science School of Basic and Applied Sciences, Galgotia University will participate and collaborate in the crime-free Bharat mission. I am highly obliged to Mr. Amarpal Sokin, Assistant Director, Chemistry, Forensic Science Laboratory, Delhi government for being with us here today as our guest of honor and sharing his vast experience and knowledge with our participants. My heartfelt gratitude is for Professor Dr. Preeti Vajaj, Honorable Vice Chancellor for guiding us on every step of the way of organizing the FDP. My heartfelt thanks is for our pro Vice Chancellors, Professor Dr. Venkatesh Babu, Professor Dr. Avdesh Kumar and Professor Dr. P.K. Sarma for their constant support and motivation. I convey my sincere thanks to Mr. Nitin Pandey, CEO, and Mr. Atul Dubey, Managing Director, Forensic India Private Limited, for their kind support and generosity. I also thank Professor Dr. A.K. Jain, Dean, School of Basic and Applied Science, and convener of the FDP for his untimely support and guidance. My heartfelt gratitude is towards all our invited speaker of our upcoming session for graciously accepting our invitation and taking time for us from their busy schedule. Thank you all dignitaries. Also, I share a big round of applause for all our young student organizer for the amount of meticulous planning and coordination they have shown to make this event a successful one. I also thank the team of very motiv motivated and dedicated fraternity members of the Department of Forensic Science who knew their job and are result oriented. I would also like to thank people who gave administrative and technical support. And lastly, I would like to thank all the participants of the event and wish them all the very best of luck for uh, upcoming session. With these words, I once again wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajiv, sir. Thanks. Moving on, 
would now like to introduce Dr. Khushali Joshi, Forensic Expert Lecturer, Representative IEIF, Cursos, Brazil. Ma'am has done her doctorate in Forensic Science and currently she is the representative of IEIF Cursos, Brazil. Previously, she was a lecturer at Sardar Patel Medical Institute. Ma'am has delivered multiple lectures in national and international conferences and has published many research papers in forensic biology. Ma'am will be sharing her knowledge on insights of nanotechnology and its approach to forensic science. May I request Kushali Ma'am to please take over the charge of the session. Thank you so much, Kushali. Am I audible? Yes, Ma'am. Okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tugal Gautia's University and uh, Forensic India for inviting me here and all the uh, legendary dignitaries and all the students who are present here. So we'll start for our today's session. So uh, is my screen visible? Uh, Uh, can you all uh, see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's now visible. Okay. So, yes. Yes, ma'am, it's visible now. Okay, thank you. So, yes, so our uh, today's session, we are going to discuss about the uh, nanotechnology and its approach to the forensic sciences. So, uh, nanotechnology is uh, basically an uh, engineering subject, as we can see. And it is nowadays, there is a huge, huge uh, approach where we can find out in the forensic sciences. So and let's have a talk on it. So before we start, let's have an idea that what is nano, like uh, the meaning of nano. So nano is a prefix. Okay. So in the Greek, the word nano means dwarf, means extremely small. Uh, it is the name of the unit measures like 1 billion, right? So uh, if we say, so it is 1 billion of a meter, means 10 raised to minus 9 meter, right? So let's understand the size first. See, average of a small plant of a rose, if we averagely see, it can be up to 1 meter, right? A normal house fly, which we are seeing in our house, that can be 1 centimeter. The eye of that uh, fly can be 100 micrometer. And that hair, small hair of that uh, fly, that can be one micrometer. And then our DNA can be 10 micrometer, right? So 10 nanometer. And the one molecule among that DNA, that will be one nanometer. Right, so a nanometer is a one billion of a meter, that is 10 to minus nine. So this is roughly 10 times the size of an individual atom, right? Any atom will be there. So the 10th part of that atom, that will be called as a nano. So now let's have a uh, view on what is technology, right? Till now we have seen what is nano. Now we'll see what is technology. So the branch of the knowledge that deals with a certain field that will be a technology, right? For example, engineering is a technology. Industrial arts, that is a technology. Then applied sciences means our forensic science, what we are doing in the forensic, that will be also a technology. Pure sciences, what the people are doing, that can be also a technology. So when we are dealing our uh, with a very small, uh, in, uh, very small atoms or very small molecules with uh, the use of technology, that it is called nanotechnology. So the engineering of a functional system at a molecular scale, right, a very small scale. The manipulation of a structure of matter at a molecular level, right. So that can be called as a nanotechnology. So basically, if we very simply, if we say, so it means a small technology, small part of small molecules. And at that level, if we are using technology, so that will be nanotechnology. And when we are using this nanotechnology to our forensic sciences for various means, 
So that will be forensic nanotechnology. Right. So first of all, Richard Feynman, 29th December in 1959, at the meeting of American Physical Society at California, first time he uh, present uh, the thought over the nanotechnology. So he is known as the father of nanotechnology. And in his uh, presentation, first sentence what he spoke is, there's a plenty of room at the bottom. Right. So by that way, by that thought, the whole nanotechnology or all the research has been started. So what will be, what is the working concept of nanotechnology? How it got, works, right? So let's start with a very small uh, part for the atoms, right? So atoms are the building blocks of all the matters in the universe to all, right? So we all know that there are the 114 uh, atoms are there, means that the elements are there, and it is made up of all the atoms, right? Hydrogen, helium, lithium, oxygen, whatever it is. So all are having atoms. And those atoms and molecules stick together because of they have the complementary shape, right? Like a lock and key, what we are having. A particular lock is having a particular key to open or close it. Right? Because why it is so? Because they both are having a complementary shapes. Right? That's why it is getting open or closed. In one particular lock, we cannot uh, open it with another key. Right? Because its shape is not that complementary. Right? Or the charges are uh, the same. Or sorry, the negative charges will be there. Right? Negative or positive. So the positively charged atoms will stick to the negatively charged atom, right? So those are uh, creating the attraction in between the atoms and the molecules. And like that, all the things are stick together. So every atom has exhibit of different property as a various conditions, right? All the atoms will work differently in their different conditions like heat, pH, um, environment, pressure. Right. So the goal of nanotechnology is to manipulate the atom individually and then uh, make a pattern to produce a desired structure. Right. So what here basically we are doing in the nanotechnology, that if the atoms or if the molecules are having a specific kind of structure, so by manipulating them individually, all the atoms will uh, manipulate individually and we will create our desired structure. Whatever we want to make, like that, we will create a different uh, structure that will be used according to our design, right? So the most appropriate uh, properties of nanoparticles are size dependent. Here, what we are doing or what we are working, that will be the main concept will be the size. So the novel properties of nanoparticles do not prevail until the size has been reduced to the nanometer scale, right? So first and foremost, if we want to work with the nanoparticles, we want to focus on size. Until and unless the molecular or the atoms will reach to nanometer size, it won't work according to our wish, or we, we can't manipulate according to what we want to decide. Right? The particle size plays a crucial role in nanoparticles properties and therefore an essential task in property characterization of the nanoparticle is practical season. So here, if we want to uh, apply nanotechnology or the nanoparticles according to our desire, so first and foremost, we have to modify the atoms and the molecules to the nanoparticle sizes, right? We have to reduce the size and then we can use according to our needful, needful things, right? So how we can modify it? What are the tools uh, that can, we can uh, modify our normal molecules to or the reduce the size towards the nano tools, right? Uh, nanomaterials. So there are various number of tools are, uh, available so uh, mainly uh, we can say there will be uh, X-ray diffraction or the optical uh, spectroscope, scanning tunneling microscope, UV visible spectroscopy, 
uh, absorption and uh, photoluminous or the microscopy, Raman spectroscopy, so many uh, SEM is there, PEM is there. So all those uh, tools are there which is worked, which can be worked with the nanotechnology or the nanoparticles. So uh, let's see one by one how it is working. So first of all, we'll discuss the X-ray diffraction. The spacing of atoms in a crystal rate uh, lattice can be determined by means of location and intensity of spots producing an photographic field beam of X-rays of given wavelength after the beam has been diffracted in the electrons of the atom. So light from a point source is focused on an object and light waves are scattered by the object, then scattered uh, waves will be recombined by the series of lens and generate an enlarged image of the object, right? How it is uh, really working, we'll see here. So if, for example, there is a, any molecule or any atom, so a large beam of light will be uh, spotted over the particular uh, atom. And because of that, the light will be scattered around. And that scattered light will be captured and then it will be uh, generated a, a molecular level image over here, like this, what we can see. So in a typical setup, a collimated beam of X-ray is inserted on the samples, like this here, what we can see. And the intensity of diffracted X-rays is measured as a function of diffracted angle, right? So when a particular angle, the light has been diffracted, here we can see. So the sharpness and the shape of the spot are related to the perfection of the crystal and the two basic procedure involve either a single crystal or a powder. And here, like that, we can see the uh, image, what we are getting. So uh, this is the tabletop X-ray diffraction from the here. See here, we have to put the samples. And after uh, placing the sample, uh, software is connected with this, and that will be a screen. And on screen, we can get the, this chart like this. Here we can see the different uh, points where the or the molecules are, which are getting uh, shown or uh, will be seen here. Like different uh, materials or different molecules can be seen here in the form of chart. Then the second uh, tool which is used in the nanotechnology that is optical spectroscopy. So the optical spectroscopy uses the interaction of light with matter and function of wavelength or energy in order to obtain the information about the material. Right? For example, very uh, common example for this optical spectroscopy is UV visible spectroscopy, which is we are very widely using in forensic sciences or in the biology department. Uh, and um, chemical department or um, chemistry department, many it is very famous, right? and very widely used. So this technique involves absorption of near UV or visible lights, and one measures both the intensity and the wavelength. And right? we all know the Beer Lambert law, and based on that, this UV visible spectroscopy is working. And here, yes, this like this, we can see the. This is gold, okay, this gold nanoparticle size of absorption wavelength we can see here. So the gold nanovisible absorption directly related to the nanoparticle sizes, right? Whatever the particle size will be there, according to that, they will show the absorption here and they will show the chart over here. So addition to saturate the chloroauric or acid solution in the molecular ratio, so 0 0.17 to 1.4 acts to stabilize various nanoparticle sizes. Right? So the absorption band moves from 577 nanometer to 523 nanometer, suggesting that initial uh, cold nanoparticle size of 100 nanometer and a final uh, cold nanoparticle size up to 20 nanometer at the cyclic to the gold model ratio. And here, this, here we can see the charts. Yeah. So this is also UV visible analysis of uh, cold nanoparticle complexes, conjugation formations. So here we can see this red, it is showing the aurum that is cold nanoparticle. The gray line, this is showing the casein. Then the scan line is showing the lead. The magenta line is showing the phosphatidate chlorine. And like that, 
all the lines are showing or uh, this year we can see the different uh, absorption uh, ratios right for the gold nanoparticle conjugation with the other organic substances then which is uh, useful in the nanotechnology and which is very commonly used that is raman spectroscopy right so when the electromagnetic radiation passes through the metal most of the radiation continues in its original direction but a small fraction scattered into the other direction right so this is the basic principle how, how the raman spectroscopy or the raman scattering will work so light that is scattered uh, due to vibrations in the molecule so those uh, solids is called as a raman scattering and raman spectroscopy is the measurement of the wavelength intensity and intensity scattered light from molecules right so the raman scattered light occurs at the wavelength they are shipped from the incident light to the energies of the molecular vibrations so such a scattering process is a bit experimentally a lesser is needed for the good signal that we all know then comes the fluorescent spectroscopy so at the room temperature most of the molecules occupy the lowest vibration right so at that level of ground electron state and the absorption light of uh, are elevated to produce a excited state right that is uh, very common that at the room temperature at the normal level the, uh, all the molecules will be at the ground state and if we want to uh, make them to excited state we have to uh, give the outer or the uh, external source that is that will be the absorption of the light so having absorbed it energy and reached one of the higher vibrations levels uh, for an excited state so molecular resistance gets access to the vibrational energy and by collision and falls of the lowest vibration level and from the excited state so a plot of emission against a wavelength of any given excited wavelength is known as the emission spectrum so that will be the principle of fluorescence spectroscopy then comes uh, the atomic force microscopy right uh, nowadays uh, as the technology is getting advanced so atomic force microscopy sam and tem are mostly or very widely used for this nanotechnology use so it enables us to study non conducting surfaces because it scan wonderful force which is its atomic tips so here previously whatever the techniques we have discussed so they are uh, mostly focusing on their principle are on the uh, molecular level or the exciting level or the electrons what they are having whatever the lights they are absorbing or the scattering but here atomic force microscopy will focus on the bonds uh, are having in between the two molecules and especially the van der waals bonds so the main components of this tool are thin sandel level with the extremely sharp probing tip and the 3d piece of electron scanner and the optical system measure deflection of the sandel bar so when the tip is brought into contact with the surface or uh, in its proximity tapping the surface it being affected by a combination of the surface that is attractive and repulsive right we know that van der waals bonds have two types one bonds will be attractive and the another will be repulsive right and like that the whole molecule will be uh, can stay in a stable form so those forces cause centrifugal bending and uh, which is that which is continuously measured via the deflection and the reflection lasers so the three scanners move the sem uh, sample or in the alternative design right so the sample uh, dimensions the scanning predetermined area of the surface and the vertical resolution of the tool is extremely high reaching to 0.01 nanometer and which is for the order of atomic radius so whatever the atomic radius will be there at there there will be either uh, attractive uh, force or the repulsive force and uh, those forces uh, will be measured by the centrifugal or a small laser and uh, that radius will be continuously captured and like that we can have an idea or we can have uh, the image 
of the Thetamus source microscopy, right? Whatever the force, see here the name itself, you can identify. Whatever the force is generated by the attempts, by, and we are keeping the record of it with the help of microscope. So that is called as atomic force microscopy, right? So here, this is the tip. This is the centilever, the laser beam will pass from here. And this is the photo detector, whatever the laser is, uh, passing through here, like it is getting like this, and here is the photo detector, and by that way we are getting the pictures through the software, right? So yeah, and this is the picture how we can see the surface. See here, it is a very small size, yeah, tube all on, and this is the uh, chemical probe, and here we can see. Things generate picture. Then let's talk about the transmission electron microscopy, which is called TEN. So TEN is a high voltage electron emitted by a cathode that is focused on by a lens. So the sample is first placed under the vacuum, right? And after that, a high voltage electron beam is partially transmitted through the uh, molecule and then the transmitted electrons are subsequently focused and uh, then the beam hits the photosport screen and the photographic plate or the sensitive uh, or the sensors will create an image right so the 10 only provides two dimensional image for the sample right for the uh, like uh, diffraction patterns or regarding the inner surface of the material. See, like this. So, here what happens when a, a forced electron is coming here, right? So, it is creating uh, the sensors over uh, here over, and then it is catching the picture, right? Here, like that. This is the uh, how the tech person look like. Right? And here we can see the 2D, that is inner structure images. Now comes the SEM, that is scanning electron microscope. So the SEM is very different from the TEM, right, in the ways of final images. Why? Because uh, what TEM is doing, TEM is uh, creating the 2D image, right? 2D image means if we want to see the inner structure, that uh, what is uh, you know, a very small kind of structure we have to study. So at that time we should use them. But when we need the 3D structure, we want to study the morphology or the surface of any particular substance. At that time we should use the cell. Because while well, then detects the primary electrons, same generates the image by secondary or backscattered electrons which is emitted from the material due to excited by the primary electron beams. So in SEM, the electron beam is scanning across the sample and building an image and mapping detecting signals, signals yeah, as a function or a beam position. So the generally resolution limit of SEM is about 5 nanometer. Right. So as we say that it is creating the 3D structure, so when we are focusing more on surface morphology, so at that time, the SEM will be very much helpful. Now, this is the SEM, and here we can see the surface morphology. See, so sharply, so beautifully, it is generating the very clean pictures. Of, uh, this is the white blood cells, okay, which is present in blood. So, this is the uh, pictures of white blood cells. Right. So, these all are the tools what we are talked about till now. So by using the such kind of tools, we can uh, get the our desired uh, size of a particle or size of the nanoparticles, or we can identify uh, uh, that nanoparticles are present over any surface or any molecules or not. So what we discussed that we first of all we have to focus on the size. And after we are getting our uh, desired size of particle, then we have to make the structure of it, right? So 
Now let's focus on the structure. First of all, we got the size. Okay, nanoparticle size, we reached up to nanometers. Then, the nanocomposites, we have to composite all the molecules, all the nanoparticles together to make uh, some structure. So those are uh, the polymers or uh, copolymers having nanoparticles or the nanofillers disappeared in the polymer matrix, right? So those shapes can be nanospheres or nanocrystals, nanotubes or quantum dots, right? So what are all these things? Let's see one by one. So first of all, uh, it is, let's talk about the carbon nanotubes, right? So carbon nanotubes, so carbon nanotubes, are allotropes of carbon with a cylindrical nanostructure, right? When we are making a cylindrical structure with the nanoparticles, so that will call as a nanotube. So they have length to diameter ratio up to 30 lakh and 20,000 gem one. Like it is very huge number, right? So nanotubes are the member of fluorocentrine structural family. Right? Fullerens, fullerens structure family. They derive from their long hollow structure with the walls formed one thick sheet of carbon called the graphene. It's not graphite, it's graphene. Right? So, what are the properties of carbon tubes? So, they are highest strength of weight ratio, helps in creating lightweight uh, spacecrafts. Right? Whatever the things. Uh, uh, we are using the spacecraft. So at that time, what uh, the scientists are keeping in the mind that it should be very strong. It's, as well as uh, simultaneously, it should be very light in the weight, right? So that time, this carbon nanotubes will be very much helpful because it is made with the nanoparticles. So uh, the weight and size will be reduced, but its uh, strength will be very high. It easily penetrates the membranes such as cell walls. So it is helping the cancer treatments, right? So electrical resistance changes significantly when the other molecules themselves to carbon atoms. So it helps in the developing sensors and detecting the chemical weapons. So how it uh, all this works, so we'll see it later in our slides that how it is working in the cancer treatment, how it is working with the chemical vapors, finding the chemical vapors, right? First, now we are focusing on just on the shape of the different uh, nanomaterials. So what are the application of the nanotube? So as we said, it is stem bell spots uh, using the CNT, making bicycle com uh, components, right? This is the company, which is called the stem bell spots. They are making the bicycle up from them. Then Cerex technology using the CNT for manufacturing lightweight Works. Right. Then replacing the transistors from the silicon chips as they are small and emit less heat. Right. So, whatever the silicon chips we are having in the transistor or in the pen drives or in any electronic materials, what we are using. So, nowadays they are, that can be replaced by the nanotubes because they are very smaller in size and they are not emitting as much as heat what silicon chips will do. They especially work in the electric cables and wires, solar cells, and in many fabrics also. Then another uh, shape of uh, nanoparticle that is nano rods. Right? First, uh, previously we saw that is nano tube. Now let's see the nano rods. So they are one morphology of a nanoscale object. So its dimension ranges from one to hundred nanometer. So they may be synthesized from the metal or semiconducting materials, right? So a combination of lichens act as a shape control agents and bond to different facets of the nano road with a different strength and it allow different phases of the nano road to grow at different rate that we, uh, for producing an elongated object, right? So what are the uses of it? So in display technology, because the reflectivity of the roads can be changed by the changing their orientation with an applied electronic fields. 
So it is highly used in uh, LED and LCD uh, screens, what we are seeing in our laptops or in our uh, TV or whatever the screen we are seeing nowadays. So that uh, area, the nanorods will be used. And micro electron, uh, micro mechanical systems, right? And in the cancer therapeutics. Then, a uh, very uh, beautiful and very interesting structure for uh, this uh, nanoparticles will be nanobots. So it is made up of uh, two words, that is nanorobots. So that are nanobots, right? So what is that? So it is close to the cell of 10 to minus nine, almost one nanometer size. So largely uh, they are in R&D phase. They are not widely used. They are in, still in the research and development phase, but it is uh, being uh, said that it is going to change the many, many, many technologies in the coming years. So nanoports of 1.5 nanometers across and they are capable of counting the specific molecules into chemical samples. Right. Since the, the uh, nanorobots uh, would be microscopic in size, it would be probably necessary for a very large number of them to work together to microscopic and microscopic task. So they are capable of replication using environmental resources. So what will be the application of that? So detection of toxic components in the environment. Right. In the drug delivery, in the biomedical instrumentations, this kind of nanoports will going to help. So how in the drug delivery, for example, as we previously also uh, say uh, that it will be helpful in the cancer uh, detection or the cancer drug delivery. So how it will work? Then, uh, for example, if a person is having cancer in any particular area of their body, for example, in their lungs, right? So the chemical therapeutics, what we are getting now, what we say, a chemo doses. So chemo doses, what we do, they will insert the uh, medicine in their vein, right? So that uh, uh, medicine is going towards uh, like all the uh, cells in the body, right? It will enter in the blood and through blood, it will go all through the body. So uh, because of its side effects, we know that if a cancer patient is going under through chemotherapy, so he loses his hair, uh, he's having uh, digestion problems, he's having um, other, so many, lot of many issues, skin issues like that. Why? Why it is so? Because of the side effects of the chemotherapy. But if uh, in future, if we are using these nanoports or nanotechnologies, so in drug delivery, where, for example, if the cancer cells are present in their lungs, so this nanoports directly goes to that specific area and then deliver the drug. And uh, because of that, the whole body structure or all the cells of the body is not getting affected. Okay? So this is the uh, under the research and development phase. So yeah, what we talked about, nanotechnology in the cancer. So it provides a new option for drug delivery and the drug therapies enable drugs to deliver to precisely at the right location in the body and releases drug dose on the predetermined schedule for the optional treatment, right? Attach the drug to the nano-sized carrier, carrier, and they become localized at the disease site, that is cancer tumor. So the drugs will go to the cancer tumors only, and it is killed only tumor cells and not the healthy or the nearby cells. And then a port can clear the blockage in the arteries also, what are uh, having uh, this. Uh, so like that, it will work. The other uses for the nanotechnology that is also in fabrics. So the properties of familiar materials are being changed by the manufacturer who are adding nano-sized components to the conventional materials to improve the performance, right? To make uh, the fabric more smoother, uh, more finer. And uh, the another use for the nanotechnology is in, uh, uh, for uh, this uh, heat or heat resistance or the cold resistance like that. The in fabrics also nanotechnology.
technology has been used. So some clothing manufacturers are making water and stain repellent cloth using the nano sized uh, whiskers in the fabric that cause the water to bead up on the surface. Right? In the manufacturing of bulletproof jackets and uh, spill and dirt resistant antimicrobial antibacterial fabrics. So in that technology also nanoparticles are having a very huge role. Right? In the electronics. So the electrodes made from the nanowires enable flat, flat panel display to be flexible as well as the thinner than the current flat panel displays, right? So nowadays what you are seeing in the curved TV or a curved display or a curved phone, so that is all because possible with the help of nanotechnology. So nanolithography is a use for the fabrication of chips. The transition, the transistors are made of the nanowires and they are assembled in a glass or a thin film or a flexible plastic, right? Here, uh, what we can see, very small, very flexible, and yet very resistant um, chips or the nanowires or the glass films we can produce. Then e-paper displays on the sunglasses and map on the car machine. So that all things can be possible through it. So yes, still now whatever we discuss, that is about the nanotechnology and its application in the different field. Right. But what is the application in the forensic sciences? Right. So there are a huge number of applications of foreign, in the forensic sciences of nanotechnology and the nanoparticles. For example, in explosives, toxicology, pathology, serology, question documents, fingerprinting, uh, forensic engineering. So lots and lots more there. Okay. So let's go uh, one by one and discuss. So let's end. So at present, in the quantification of post PCR, that is polymer gene reaction, is the utmost extensive forensic nanotechnology application in the microfluidic system. Right. So nowadays, what you are uh, in the market, what we are having the automated uh, PCR machines or uh, automated uh, extraction uh, extractors are available. So in those things, uh, the forens, uh, this nanoparticles will be having a high rate. So in a very short period of time, there is within hardly 30 minutes, the DNA samples can be quantified even in nanoliter range. Right. If, we are not having samples. Of course, in the forensic sciences, it has always been said for the forensic biologists that they are always uh, are in the uh, run for the samples. They are don't having samples, right? So if they are having even a nanoliter sample, it means a very small amount of sample. So by the use of forensic nanotechnology and the nanoparticles, the quantified uh, quantification DNA samples extra extraction can be possible. So the magnetic nanoparticles, for example, silica-based magnetic nanoparticles and copper nanoparticles for the extraction of good quality of PCR-ready DNA samples from a different forensically significant body fluids and the skeletal remain samples, right? So it will be used most importantly in the skeletal remains or the body fluids. At that time, what they are doing is they will use the nanoparticles of silica and nanoparticles of the copper, and by that they will uh, extract the DNA sample and perform the PCR. So the DNA extracted from the urine, they are using organic reagents, while uh, carboxylated magnetic nanoparticles uh, used with the solid phase and absorbent to the isoelectronic DNA for the PCR amplification. Then comes the forensic toxicology. So in the current scenario, nanotechnology most effectively applied in the field of forensic or toxicology for the detection and quantification of different toxic substances from various uh, forensically important evidences like blood, saliva, hair, vitreous humor, even from the skeletal remains or fingerprint samples. Right. So if any a small amount of uh, toxicological evidence will be uh, present in 
this kind of evidences, there can be chances that by use of nanotechnology or the nanoparticles, we can uh, extract from it. Right. So for the identification purpose, gold and nanoparticles uh, ranging from 10 nanometer to 30 nanometer and the silver nanoparticles uh, ranging from the 20 nanometer and titanium oxide nanoparticles have been used and claim that these nanoparticles enhance the detection limit of the illicit drug in the fingerprint samples. Okay? For example, if a person is um, having or has uh, taken any illicit drugs and uh, for the, that drug is mixed with his blood and then it is you know, going uh, uh, with the perspiration or, or something and that person is uh, uh, having that the fingerprints like latent fingerprints somewhere so it may be possible that if by the use of all these nanoparticles we can may identify the illicit drug molecules with his latent fingerprints then forensic explosives Forensic, uh, so efficient detection of hidden explosives in luggage or mail, vehicles or aircrafts or uh, toothpaste or any public places or wherever it is, that is the major challenge for the law and enforcement agencies throughout the world. Right? And nowadays, um, very uh, uh, improvised explosive devices can be fitted in any part, like a very toothpaste. Uh, in pen or whatever, any public places. So it is very difficult to identify. Okay. So currently, trace-based explosive detection system in use, which have limitations in very selectively uh, sensitivity, right? Size, uh, then its cost. So uh, miniaturization of system to bench top or even the handheld level has immense potential, especially for the trace explosive detection. Right? So at that time when we have to uh, uh, go for the trace explosive detection, it is very difficult to perform the uh, activities or to identify those things on the ground. So hence, the highly sensitivity and selectivity combined with the ability lower the production and deployment cost of the sensor is indispensable in the winning the battle on the explosive based terrorism so what we need is very um, highly sensitive with that very cost effective and a small uh, handheld uh, device we need to identify the um, explosive or the post blast uh, investigation so in the modern research and development studies in this area of uh, the nanomaterials have demonstrated the ability of nanostructure and function as a sensor of various chemical and biological components, inclusive explosives. How? Let's see. So the scientist has developed the e-nose, that is electronic nose, right? So nose, what the nose we are having, that only, but that will be electric nose. So how it will work? Let's see. So EMOS is basically a sensor device. So in any sensor, the surface chemical processes are transformed as a signal. For example, in front of this device, if you are uh, keeping any kind of the chemicals, so they will, uh, you know, uh, previously there has uh, the data in that, and by that, uh, uh, their sensors, that chemical will get the identified. So in case of e nose, the signals are nothing but the unique order particular of a specific chemical reaction. Right? So electronic nose consists of an order sensor or a data preprocessor and the pattern recognition engine. So e nose as the manifestation of the electronic aroma detection technology. Right? This technology will identify the aroma. So what is aroma? So aroma will be a specific chemical reactions and those uh, chemical reactions will be catched by a sensor and that sensor is having a pre-processor or a pre-filled uh, data and that will match. 
right so how it is done uh, previously uh, right now also it is going on so at present the dogs have been trained and uh, used for successfully uh, to identify the hidden explosives however the dogs are costly to train and it is not possible to take dog uh, dogs all the time on the crime scene or sometimes the dogs are not able to identify the uh, dogs is uh, getting confused right so at that time or uh, it can be a uh, replace uh, replaceable technology with the dogs sniffer dogs so the electronic nose technique can mimic the bomb sniffing dogs without their drawbacks right in the dogs because dogs are also uh, uh, you know are animals Right, they are also a natural animal. So all the time, it is not possible to give exact um, detection in the every situation, right? So this at that time, this technique can be used. This technology will be very helpful. So overall, nanotechnology based sensor have strong potential and meeting all the requirements of uh, an effective solution for the detection of explosives. Right. Then comes the forensic fingerprint visualization. So we all know that on the crime scene, mostly three types of fingerprints are found. That is either a latent fingerprints or a patent or a plastic fingerprints. So almost every crime scene carries latent fingerprints, which are not easily visible with the naked eye and need for the further processing. So to decipher the latent finger marks, a range of physical and chemical method has been developed. So the various common materials other to the background and making identification considerably through the achieve. So, so what to do? So to overcome such problems and for more preciseness, nanotechnology is being used to develop the fingerprints. To decipher the fingerprint pattern, nanoscale powder has been used. So the various studies have been reported in which the nanopowders has uh, deciphered the fingerprint. In recently, one of them is reported the oxide powder. Right. So within the twenty nanometer of size, they give the better prints. So using a nanoscale developer and an X-ray source technique together. So a development um, is can be there that to visualize the imprinted fingerprints even if the casing has been rubbed or washed, right? So based on this fact, when someone leaves those finger impression on the bullet casing, right? If someone is having fingerprints on bullet casing, he is throwing that uh, bullet case, or he is rubbing his uh, fingerprints, or he is even washing with the water, right? So still. There can be a chance that with the help of nanoparticles uh, and the uh, uh, X-ray source technique, we can uh, develop these fingerprints again on the casing. Right. So the residue through a hydrophobic interaction, which can be then developed with the silver physical developer, and then which is producing the impression of rich detail that not only they improve the quality, but develop the print. But also the clarity of the print. Similarly, developed another method of fingerprint enhancer using the cadmium selenide and the zinc sulfide nanoparticles. So, in that suspension or non porous surfaces, so cadmium uh, and uh, cadmium uh, selenide and the zinc sulfide nanoparticles are the potential to give fluorescence under the UV lighting. Then, even uh, this nanoparticles having a great uh, you know, role in uh, identifying for the frauds or the question documents in the forensic sciences. So uh, most importantly, the passport frauds is the biggest threat facing the world. So it is claimed by the Interpol published uh, which is date 29 January 2019. So the greatest threat in the world is the last year there were 500 million hours or the, we can say the half billion international air arrivals worldwide where travel documents were not compared against the Interpol database. So this is a very huge number. 
So the what happens or what are the trends with the documents and uh, the other products which is uh, been, uh, getting questioned? So the sophistication of the counterfeiters are increasing. Right? Advanced printings are there. Uh, advanced manufacturing procedures are there. They are having uh, you know, a very uh, advanced level of softwares. So counterfeiting a high value or a high volume business nowadays. From it is start, you know, range from the various means like from the currency or any ID cards, um, even with the medicine, spare parts, softwares, whatever it is. So whatever uh, the things you can see around uh, ourselves, our environment. So there is a high chance that the counterfeiting the same product can be possible. So fraud and the counterfeiting is an organized crime, right? So the, it funds the large operations, including the child rapers, terrorist activities, or uh, many, many other things uh, can be involved in such things. So this need the uh, multiple layers like overt, covert, forensics, and many other fields. Right. So, technology helps in determining the authenticity of items. Right. Then, technology can also apply in the various sectors to prevent them from forged or the duplicate products. How? So, the technology is also relevant in those cases in which the petroleum products are involved, such as arson cases, examine the petroleum or hydrocarbon traces, and uh, it will be helpful. Uh, by right? generating the barcode stickers, like in those barcodes, the nanoparticles will be used in the printing, in the printing ink, and by that, this uh, uh, scanner or the barcode stickers, or by that, it can be uh, preventing for the uh, forged product or the forged documents, right? Then again, yes, nanotechnology, even can be very, very useful in the forensic medicine field too. So uh, whatever important uh, when a person or a cadaver is found or in a crime scene or if there is a dead body is found. So the first question comes in your mind is the time since death. So how much time has been passed after this person is died, right? So what are the parameters uh, to identify it? So first of all is algor mortis, right? Algor mortis means the uh, changes in the temperature, then changes in the ice, then post-mortem hypothesis, right? Then rigor mortis, then changes in the decomposition, changes in the skin color, liver mortis, then stomach or bowel content, then contents in the uh, urinary bladder, right? There's so many, so many parameters are there. And by you know, combining all the parameters together, a uh, forensic pathologist is coming to an uh, uh, verdict or uh, get a conclusion that uh, a range between this to this time, the person, the time since death can be possible, right? So all this parameter can only provide the approximate time of the death, right? So at that time, the observational changes in the body fluids like blood or um, pericardial fluid or spinal fluid or aqueous humor, vitreous humor, right? And so all this, uh, uh, these fluids will be helpful. So out of these body fluids, the vitreous humor remains unchanged. So what is uh, vitreous humor first? We all know that in our eyes when the person has died, the fluid which is present in the eye because of the uh, death of the uh, eye cells or the eyeball, eyeball cells, so that's called the vitreous tumor. So that exhibit the biochemical, uh, that is the level of amino acids which is present in there, it is very slow. And therefore, by the help of this biochemical analysis, time since death can be estimated very acutely, right? The whatever the amino acid present in our eye cells, that will take a uh, like long time or it will uh, get uh, very slowly. So by the identification of the, the quantification of estimated 
time. So recently, a smart, a rapid, and a sensitive, very cost-effective uh, uh, technique has been developed that provides easy determination of a cysteine amino acid method. So this method may lead to estimate the time since death up to 96 hours till the cysteine concentration from the vitreous human increases significantly and showing a linear correlation uh, with the expansion of Damson's death. Right, so this all are the application of uh, nanotechnology in forensic sciences and besides that there are much more many applications are there and we can uh, use it, we can uh, have a good command over that and we can uh, do a good research. So there will be many, many more chances to develop it, right? So in our Indian government also, they are having a, a very huge uh, and many research projects are there. So uh, IIT Mumbai is the premier organization in the field of nanotechnology. So research in the field of health, environment, and medicines are uh, still going on. And starting with the 2001, the government of India launched a nanotechnology initiative. Right? Then in 2017, the Nanoscience and the Technology Mission 2007 is initiated with an allocation of rupees 1,000 crores for the uh, mill years. So while the government is uh, trying to enhance or to encourage this field, so the basic it is for basic research promotions, infrastructure development for carrying out the front ranking regions, and development of nanotechnology in their applications and human resource development and the international collaborations, right? So there are many possibilities in the future that the nanotechnology may make it possible for the manufacturer of higher and stronger and programmable materials that requires the less energy to produce than the conventional materials. And then uh, that promise a you know, greater fuel efficiency in the land transportation, ships, aircrafts, or uh, even in space vehicles, right? So the future of nanotechnology could very well include in the use of nanorobotics, and these nanopods uh, have the potential to take on human tasks as well as the tasks that humans could never complete. So the rebuilding of the depletion ozone layer could potentially be able to perform in the future. So let's make a finger crossed for that. So at the end, the bottom line, I could only say that the next big thing is going to be really small. So thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. And all of you have a great day ahead. And again, thank you all uh, people. And thank you, Gokotia's University, for allowing me to come here and deliver our lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this informative session. Uh, may I please, please request Neha Yadav to present the virtual salutation to Dr. Krishali Joshi. Thank you so much, ma'am, for graciously accepting our invitation and sharing your deep knowledge about nanotechnology and its various application in forensic science, even despite of different time zones. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to ask you, ma'am, to kindly accept our gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. And ma'am, we would love to have you in person at our university once the condition normalizes. Sure, I, it will be my pleasure to uh, meet you all and be there. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh